3D camera trackers have become a common tool in modern visual effects, but Meshroom is something much more. With Meshroom, you can reconstruct your entire set in 3D in addition to the camera animation. Meshroom is open source, so it's completely free for commercial work. Most people think of it as just a way to scan 3D objects. We'll certainly cover that here, but our main focus, as is always the case at Moviola.com, is to see how we can use it for filmmaking. And we think that once you get your head around the possibilities, you won't want to go back. Meshroom accepts image sequences rather than QuickTime files, so you'll want to convert your videos first. Also, consider adjusting the black point, white point, and gamma of your footage to get the best detail contrast. In this shot, we increased the contrast in the blacks to pick up more detail in the tree shadows. Finally, Meshroom uses metadata embedded in the file to determine the focal length of the camera. Now, things will work just fine if you don't have embedded metadata, but it will help things if you do. We injected the metadata into our JPEG files here using the free app Analog Exif. Again, this is a completely optional step. If you do, you want to enter the make and model exactly as listed on the VFX camera database, vfxcamdb.com. That's the database that Meshroom uses to pull sensor size information. We also knew that we used a 4.2 millimeter wide angle lens on our drone's GoPro, so we added that to the metadata as well. In the case of Analog Exif, change the metadata for one file, and then use the copy function to copy it to other files. Okay, let's launch Meshroom. There are three main sections to the interface. The Images pane at left, the 3D viewer to the right, and the Node Graph Editor. Don't be intimidated by that long train of nodes. All the processing moves from left to right, and for most common workflows, you can leave things as they're set up for you. Start by dragging the folder with your image sequence into the Images pane. A red aperture icon means that it couldn't find the metadata it was looking for. Again, it'll still work, so this isn't the end of the world. Hover over the icon for more detail. If, like us, you injected metadata, you'll see a green aperture icon. Hover to confirm the metadata is accurate. Now, there's a very tempting big green start button at the top of the screen. Don't press it. Okay, you can if you really want to, but if you have a lot of frames to process, it can take a really long time. Instead, right-click the Structure from Motion node and click Compute. You'll be warned that because you haven't saved the project, it'll cache to a default directory. Now, that's a bad idea, so let's save the project first. Wherever you choose to save the project is also where it'll create a cache directory. Meshroom's cache files can get really big, so make sure you have plenty of space on the drive you use. You see, it creates EXR files for each frame that can be much bigger than the original source frames themselves. Now when you right-click Structure from Motion and click Compute, Meshroom goes to work. It starts working left to right with each node representing a different stage in the process. As each stage completes, the thin colored strip in the node's heading turns green. You can select a node and then click the Log tab to see information about the processes it's executing. The Structure from Motion node is where the important magic happens. It's where Meshroom compares the features in all the different frames to figure out which objects have moved where. Now we have over 800 Ultra HD frames in our sequence, so we're headed out for dinner. And three taquitos and a burrito later, we're back and ready to continue the process. The reason we stopped you from pressing the big friendly green start button is that there are nodes after structure from motion that take a really, really long time. If we discover things didn't work, it's better to find out before you let Meshroom do all that extra work. In the viewer, you should see a point cloud representing features in your scene and a camera trail. To navigate in the viewport, click and drag the middle mouse to pan the view, left-click and drag to rotate the view, 
and scroll the scroll wheel to zoom. To change the center pivot of the scene, double click a feature. The scene will now rotate and zoom around that point. And if you get a little lost, right click in the viewer and choose Fit All to fit the entire scene in the viewer. Although for a large outdoor scene like ours, that's not all that helpful. Or right click and choose Reset View, which takes you back to the default location. Now your default view may be upside down, so be prepared to rotate. Drag the point size slider to adjust the scale of the individual points in the point cloud. Scaling them up until they almost overlap may help give you a better sense of the features in the scene. Then drag the camera scale so that the camera icons are a reasonable size relative to the scene. If all went well, you should be able to make out features of your scene in the point cloud. As we cover in our camera tracking fundamentals, your camera needs to have been physically trucking or dollying around the scene. Tripod rotations aren't enough to create the parallax required for a 3D solve. Okay, well if all you wanted was a solved camera, you're done right here. To export the tracked camera, right click in the Node Graph Editor and start typing Export. Choose Export Animated Camera. Perform the same mouse shortcuts we used in the viewer to pan and zoom the node view. Drag a connector noodle from the output of the Structure from Motion node to the input of the new Export Animated Camera node. Click the Export Animated Camera node to load its properties to the right. Now we advise always exporting a JPEG sequence with the Undistorted option enabled as a sanity check. You'll see what we mean a little later. Meshroom automatically creates output paths for the undistorted images and the camera file inside the main Meshroom cache directory you chose when you first saved the project. Right-click the Export Animated Camera node and choose Compute. When it's done, you can right-click on either the Output File Path or Camera File Path labels to open the folder in a System Desktop window. Meshroom stores the camera animation in an Alembic file format. Alembic is a pretty standard cross-platform file format and most 3D and visual effects software supports it. If your software doesn't, you can always use the free open source package Blender to convert it to another format like FBX. Time to check the camera solve. For simplicity, we'll hop in a nuke, load the original source footage, the undistorted footage, and then load the exported Alembic file into a 3D camera. Of course, you can use your favorite 3D animation or compositing package to perform the same test. Comparing the original footage with the undistorted footage, we can see that Meshroom has incorrectly guessed an off-center location for the center of the lens, pushing the image a little out of frame. A simple fix for this is to transform the footage back to the original position of the source footage, then apply that same transform to any renders you create from the Meshroom scene cameras. We'll cover that process in another video. For now, let's just use the undistorted plates provided by Meshroom and confirm that it lines up with our camera. We'll add a simple cube to the nuke scene, give it a checkerboard texture, and then connect it to a scanline renderer along with the camera and the undistorted background plate. Moving and scaling the cube a little and playing back, we can see that our cube moves naturally with the perspective changes in the tracked camera. Now, of course, we didn't come all the way to Meshroom just for a 3D camera solve. Now that we know the solve's good, let's return to Meshroom to get a mesh for our scene. The little cloud of dots Meshroom made is nice, but it's not actual geometry. For that, Meshroom does some clever optical flow math. It creates depth mats for each image and combines that with the structure for motion data to create a best estimate of how the surface of the scene should look. And if you thought the structure for motion process took a little while, just wait for this one. Right click the final node in the chain, texturing, and click compute. Then, depending on the power of your workstation and the length of your sequence, either go play cards for a while or go to bed for the night. When it's completed, 
If you don't see a final model, click the Load Model button. Disable the structure from Motion Point Cloud by clicking its eye icon to view the created mesh without the point cloud. You can toggle the visibility of the mesh model here as well. You'll see that it has done an impressive job of building the geometry of our outdoor set based on the drone footage. Now you may notice several holes in the building. Those are parts of the scene that were never filmed by the drone or proved confusing, like the reflections in the window of the building. We could have added more drone shots to the solve or included additional high quality shots from a DSLR to fill in the gaps. In our case, all the important surfaces like the road, rooftop and building walls are present, so we're good to go. While we're using Meshroom to create a model of our film set, you can of course use it to create digital models of real world objects. In that case, you'd take a set of high res stills from different angles and feed them into the software instead of an image sequence. But look, we're filmmakers, so using it to get both the tracked path of the camera and a virtual model of the set is kind of awesome. Now that the compute's done, the model is ready to use as an OBJ mesh. Select the texturing node and right click the output mesh label to find the containing folder. You'll see the mesh OBJ, texture files, and a material file. OBJ is a format that should load into just about any 3D aware application on the planet. You may, however, have some issues with software that doesn't support multiple UV maps, or you may just want the simplicity of a single texture map. In that case, click the texturing node and try changing the unwrap method to one of the other options which generate a single atlas UV texture map. Then recompute the node. The catch is, this will take a lot longer to compute. Click the Log tab in the Properties to see the progress. This time, we'll perform the quality check in Maya. We'll drag the object from its folder into the Maya viewport. Along with the camera we retrieved from the structure from Motion node. If we align the viewport with our solved camera, we can confirm that the model tracking matches our original source scene. If you then parent the mesh to the camera root null, you can begin to align the scene to the world X, Y, and Z by adjusting the rotation and translation of that camera root. You can disable the selection highlighting in each viewer to see the texturing of the building as you make the adjustments. Seeing as the default rotation order is X, then Y, then Z in Maya, perform the rotation alignment in that order. Be sure to align the ground and the mesh with the ground plane in Maya. Also, remember to change the perspective viewer back to the default perspective view instead of the solved camera. If you don't, you may not be able to move the perspective or worse, you may end up changing the solved camera keyframes. Again, we're performing these steps in Maya but you can obviously perform the same processes in the 3D package of your choice. If we click on the mesh, notice just how dense it is. This particular model is over 100 megabytes in size on disk and contains 1.6 million polygons. With a decent graphics card, that may be fine, but as part of a larger scene setup, that can really start to bog things down. So head back to Mesh Room, right click in the node graph, and start typing Mesh Decimate. Select the Mesh Decimate node and wire the output of mesh filtering to its input. Our current model in Maya is reporting 800,000 vertices. Let's set the Mesh Decimate vertex maximum to 100,000. Right click and choose Compute. When it's finished, double click the node to load the lower resolution model into the viewer toggle off the visibility of the original high-res mesh. We now have a model with the same basic detail, but with one-eighth the memory footprint. If you want to texture this new mesh, right-click, duplicate the texturing node, select the duplicated node, right-click the input mesh connection dot on the duplicated node and choose Remove. Then, drag the mesh decimate output to the input of the new texturing node 
in place of the previous input. If you like, you can change the texturing parameters in the Properties pane, adjusting the resolution of the texture and the Unwrap method. Right-click the Duplicate Texturing node and choose Compute. When it's finished, you'll have a new output folder containing the lower resolution mesh and a matching set of textures. Nice. Let's rewind for a moment. Back after we solved for the camera using the Structure from Motion node, we had to perform those additional steps to get our original high density mesh. Now, through the magic of video editing, that happened in a few seconds. But in the real world, we had a 20 core dual Xeon processor workstation crunching the numbers on our 800 plus Ultra HD frames for a few hours. Now, if you don't have that kind of time or horsepower on your hands, you can use a less accurate, but much faster, shortcut. It uses the point cloud generated by the Structure from Motion step to build the mesh rather than the more accurate depth maps used by the default process. And here's how. Right-click Depth Map, and then click the Fast Forward icon to the right of Duplicate Nodes. This duplicates the Depth Map node and all the nodes following it. Click to select the duplicated Depth Map node and press Delete to remove it. Also delete the duplicated Depth Map Filter node. Now wire the output of Structure from Motion to the duplicated Meshing Nodes input. And the output of Prepare Dense Scene to the duplicated Texturing Nodes Images Folder input. By now you know the drill. Right click Texturing and click Compute. When it's done, double click the new texturing node to load the model into the viewer, hiding any previous meshes or point clouds. Many times this will give you an adequate result in a fraction of the time of using the detailed depth maps. Well, that about wraps this survival guide on using Meshroom for visual effects. We now have a virtual representation of both the scene and the camera from our footage.